Welcome, everybody, to this episode of The Call Sheet. I'm your host, filmmaker AJ Wedding, flipping through my past and future call sheets to find guests from the film and television industry. This episode is being recorded during the worldwide pandemic via Zoom so that my guests and I can stay in our respective homes safely, and we encourage all of you to do the same. Today, we're talking to an accomplished director, writer, producer, Stop me when I run out of all the things that you do uh, from shows such as Battlestar Galactica, Defiance, Life Goes On, Flipper, The Flash, Black Sails. Pretty much uh, if you've watched an episode of television, Michael Nankin has directed one of them, probably. <laughs> <laughs> so welcome, Michael, to the show. <laughs> Thank you. It's a pleasure being here. Um, you need to look out for that guy behind you, though. Oh, yes. Uh, he's a little terrifying, but at least he's more interesting to look at than me. So I'd like to find out, by the way, speaking of things that are terrifying, how you're handling all of this that's going on right now. My wife and I are in our house and we're doing well. And, you know, we actually, you know, we're living in Canada and we came back here from the States 10 days ago. So we went immediately into self-quarantine, which uh, so was, we thought would end this weekend. Right, as you with know, mandatory two week quarantine. So, our, you know, we're way ahead of the curve. We've been inside for, you know, we've been here not seeing anybody for 12 days already. Nice. Pretty much the same it's thing. It's shocking here. how fast things change. It really is. And, and watching this all unfold is really um, surreal. I mean, I don't, I don't know what's going to happen next. I don't think anybody really knows. I think it's, it's interesting just to observe and just kind of go with the flow. Cause what else can we do at this point? No, it's like, it's like, it's like um, suddenly all that old um, alcoholics anonymous wisdom is, is, is current, <laughs> you know, one day at a time, change the things you can control, let go of the things you don't control, like all that stuff. <laughs> it's true. So bring me back to uh, how this all started. Obviously now you're, you're still working as a, uh, an amazing director and, and writer. No, not, not now, but well, currently, <laughs> no one right now. Is this, that's for sure. Um, Actually, I should have been. I should have been in the middle of prep or, uh, right now. Oh, really? You got I shut was down. Booked out. I was booked out through the end of June, and um, now it's just you know I'm a gentleman gardener. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you know, make a business card. It might might work out. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna need gardens for sure. Um, but take me back to, I know you, you were born in LA, right? Yeah. I lived there, um, almost my whole life up until a year and a half ago. Oh, wow. So you are just freshly Canadian. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, everyone, and everyone congratulated me on my political savvy, but it really had nothing to do with it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so tell me when it, when the dream started, when did you start enjoying filmmaking and, and trying to get into it? Oh, well, you know, I didn't realize it at the time, but looking back on it, it's, you know, the, the starting point was uh, when I was 10 years old and my grandfather gave me a movie camera that he no longer wanted because he'd gotten a new one. <laughs> it made the move, the big move from standard eight to super eight. Well, wow. and so I inherited the, his like 1948 movie camera and that was the start of it. You know, it wasn't until years later that the idea of filmmaking as a job, you know, as a vocation occurred to me. I know, you know, I grew up without any example of that. And so um, it was like a slow, <laughs> a slow realization. <laughs> well, I just started making movies. From when you were 10 years old. Yeah. My well, first movie was about a... a <laughs> Uh, a family that brings the groceries home and then a cucumber comes out of the bag uh, and eats the family. <laughs> so you were interested in sci-fi even back then, I yes, guess. Yes, even then, yes. <laughs> Very nice. And uh, you spent some time also as an illustrator, I believe? Yeah, I did. I, I, you know, that, was, that preceded the, the movie camera being placed in my hand. Okay. Um, and I was always, you know, for a while I was going to be uh, an illustrator who made movies on the weekends and then in college fell into found this marvelous instructor uh, who taught animation and there were the two things I loved like smushed together 
And so for about a year and a half, um, like I supported myself uh, as a freelance animator in college and thought that's what I was going to do. And uh, the, day, the day I let go of that was, was uh, I was helping a friend make a student film that was half animated and half live action. So I was on this crazy schedule of having to produce like a thousand drawings a day <laughs> while he was shooting the live action. And uh, one night at two in the morning after, you know, a 12 hour drawing jag, listening to the radio, sitting in the room by myself, uh, I walked down the street to where he was filming the live action portion. There were like all these people and lights and they were laughing and having a good time. And I thought, I'm at the wrong end of this business. <laughs> <laughs> that's for sure post and uh and animation are are lonely jobs for yeah. sure <laughs> yeah. though they're keeping me busy at this moment so i shouldn't be uh yeah. upset by that <laughs> no every job's a lonely job these days <laughs> yeah good point yeah. <laughs> so so that project that you were working on was that um was that junior high school no that was a film called oh my god what was it called it was called Comic Strip. It was directed by my uh, filmmaking partner, David Wechter. And it was one of his film movies for, you know, for SC. He went to SC uh, film school. And uh, I went to UCLA film school. And we dropped in on each other's classes and made the same movie for both schools. And <laughs> Smart. did it that way. Very, very well done. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, and that was a story about, a, you know, a girl... A little, a, a, like a 10 year old girl with a horrible stepmother who would escape her reality by drawing cartoons and the cartoons come to life. It was that one. Nice. <laughs> and was that feature length or was it a short film? No, that was a, like, you know, eight minutes. I was going to say feature length, you'd be dead feature, by I'd now still be drawing. drawing. <laughs> <laughs> Arthritis and everything else. Yeah. <laughs> Cool. And then uh, I read in your bio, obviously, where I'm getting all this information, um, that you uh, you made a film called Junior High School and and that you got some exposure from that. Yeah, that was the start of everything. And I have to like I have to put a disclaimer on my um, like how I got started story <laughs> because it's like it'll never happen again. <laughs> you know, most, you know, uh, um I tell I got asked to tell the story a lot, and because people want to know, like, how do I get into the business? But like my story and almost everyone's story um, happened to them at that because they were that person at that time with that set of circumstances, and you know, like, I guess the I guess the stories are valuable because there's you can take what's consistent in them, but sure. you know, to try to recreate someone else's like you know break in stories. No, this won't happen. Oh, no, of course. And having, and having said that, here's my story. So um, I was a film student at UCLA in 1977, 76, 77. And my friend was, you know, my filmmaking partner who I made movies with in junior high school and high school was at SC. And we were going to a lot of uh, student film festivals and screenings and were – you know, just they were all so dark and <laughs> full of teen angst and some really, really bad, like, film experimentation left over from the 60s. And, you know, <laughs> lots of lots of things shot in fields with daisies and rack focus. And, um, they were just dreadful. And, you know, we thought, let's make a movie that will wake everybody up at these screenings. Let's just make something that's old-fashioned and colorful and happy and fun and looks like a Hollywood musical. And then we thought, well, let's actually make a musical. <laughs> and so junior high school was this film that it's a 40 minute, you know, musical comedy, you know, it's a, a 19 year old's version of, you know, what a Hollywood musical is. And, you know, we just threw everything we had at it. We had two other producing partners and, you know, we took over this high school in Burbank for an entire summer and wrote songs and choreographed dances and wrote this really silly, simple story and made a flashy, like, feel-good musical. 
which you know has kind of become the it's like the it's like the, the proto ancestor of High School Musical and Glee and all those things, for which we receive no thanks or money. <laughs> <laughs> but however, but, but it did its job, which is it was the it was the film at the festivals that woke everybody up. <laughs> like, oh, thank you. Like okay, I can just like sit back and be happy. And uh, so you know, we spent all our money and a chunk of our parents' money and. We got a grant from AFI to finish it and you know we were broke and just out of college and no connection to the movie business and no um prospects we just had this we had one print of our movie and so we scrounged together a little bit more money we rented out a theater and we had a huge screening so it was cast and crew friends and family like everyone we knew we invited the screening and we called everyone up before they came and said, if you know anybody in the movie business or anybody who knows anybody in the movie business in any capacity, bring them. <laughs> this is the only screening we can afford to have. So we had this great screen you know, the movie had the best screening it will ever have because it was all our friends and family. And they laughed at every joke and they, you know, got excited at the end and, you know, all the stuff that will never happen again, but it was a great screening. And two days later, I get a phone call. And this voice on the phone says, hi, I was at your screening. Um, I'm the head of, I'm the production manager for animation at Disney Studios. My name is Donald Duckwall. <laughs> <laughs> Who is this? He says, no, 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 no. I knew you'd say that. <laughs> you can look it up. Um, Don Duckwall, head of animation. He goes, um, could you drop a print of your film by the studio? I'd like to show it to some people here. So like, yes, at the studio two minutes later, <laughs> hand the print to the guard, two weeks go by. And in the meantime, I'm looking for a job at a lumber yard or something, you know. And um, two weeks later, a phone rings and it's the story editor for Features, a guy named Frank Paris. Um, and this is like now, this is like 1978. And... Uh, Frank Paris said, oh, I screened your film and uh, uh, you guys want to come in? We'd like to talk to you. So, okay. So we go and we have a meeting at Disney. Um, this is like two months out of college. <laughs> so we go in. Now, Disney at the time, 1978, Disney's like big movie was Herbie Goes to Monte Carlo. <laughs> it was this tiny little studio that was like crumbling because Walt was gone. No one knew what to do. They didn't know what their next direction was. They're, you know, and the uh, guy who was running the studio was Ron Miller. Um, so we have this meeting. We walk into Ron Miller's office, which was Walt's office. <laughs> and Frank Paris is there. And Don Duckwall is there. And a couple other people who are like, who are like Walt's cronies from the old days. You know, like Card Walker and like these guys that you read about when you read Disney biographies. <laughs> like there's and so there's all these men, these older men looking at us. And we're like, hi. <laughs> and uh Ron Miller says, um, we like your film. And he goes, I think that you guys can do something for us that we haven't been able to do, which is to attract the teenage audience. And we said, We yeah, we might be able to do that. And he said, So we can't pay you much money. He goes, but we'll give you offices and you guys come up with movie ideas for us. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> and that's how my career started. <laughs> that's amazing. <laughs> and in my naive arrogance, I thought, oh, well, this is how it happens for everyone, right? This is why I went to film school. This is what I, this is what I thought would happen. Like, I didn't, it didn't seem extraordinary to me at all. <laughs> Except that all my friends from film school stopped talking to me. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> so that was that was how I that's how I got in. It was crazy. It was just like that one guy, like Don Duckwall, being dragged by a friend of David's grandmother <laughs> to this like little screening. Like went, oh hmm, maybe I'll show it to some people. Like that's how it started. Like it was just this crazy lucky, you know. You just need a believer. You need someone who believes in your work, you know? Yeah. What was that like being there during that time when you're, when you have an office at Disney and you're so young and you know, all well, these. It was so like, it was just, it, it seemed like a dream. 
you know, there we were at Disney Studio, which is like a little college campus. It's so beautiful, you know. It was before they built that giant building, all the, before they built any of the giant buildings. It was the same way, you know, in the late 70s, the way Walt left it, you know, just the animation building was the main building. And, uh, you know, there was the ink and paint department and the bottom floor was all animation. Bottom two floors were animation. Top floor was, uh, you know, li live action. And, um, you know, and, you know, everything was sort of open and friendly and the dub stage, you could just drop in and watch them mix whatever movie they were mixing. And it was, you know, and we were just, and having been an animator, you know, the, the walls of the animation department uh, and the animation building were just filled with all the drawings, concept drawings and background paintings and cells and animation sketches from every one of the Disney animated films. So it's just, it was like I died and went to heaven. <laughs> and what was the what was your biggest point of success while you were there? Like what what moved you to the next point? Oh, we we, we wrote a feature and made it. <laughs> <laughs> and, <laughs> oh, and this, yeah, this little thing. So we we uh, after a month, I think after a month of being oh, and they gave us like the office they gave us was the Sherman Brothers office. <laughs> And then we inherited their secretary, Lil, who like they had been there forever and knew everything. And she liked us and she like helped us navigate. So anyway, so after a month we present uh, four ideas um, and uh, they picked one of them and they said, uh, write a script. I said, okay. <laughs> and so we had, then we had to figure out like what the writer's guild was and how to join and that whole thing. And we wrote a script, a couple months wrote a script. This is David and I. And, um, we gave him the script and uh, oh, this is, so anyway, so we give him the script and we're waiting for a week or two and Ron Miller says, come up to my office and we go into his office. He's got this like sly little smile on his face. And he hands us this little piece of paper that looks like a fortune from a fortune cookie. And it's got a five digit number on it. And we said, what's this? He says, it's your production number. He goes, you're green lit to make the movie. He goes, show this number to the departments and they'll help you out. <laughs> you said it was five digits yeah <laughs> the first one may have been a zero so <laughs> um so we you know um so we we uh so we co-directed this feature called midnight madness that was uh you know in the you know which was designed to um to achieve what they had hired us to do, which is to bring a teenage audience in. Only the way it worked is that when it was released, it didn't really bring a teenage audience in. But several years later, when HBO showed it night and day for two years, <laughs> it brought in a teenage audience. <laughs> nice. <laughs> That's awesome. And, and is that, that movie, is that what pushed you more toward television? Because I know you've done touch and oh, for a long time. it was interesting because that movie, when it came out, was a disaster. Um, you know, the what happened was Disney. You know, they said, right, make a make a you know like a PG R rated comedy, give us Animal House, which we did, and then they decided that that wasn't what they wanted, and they did an edit which made it a movie that we hated and they hated, <laughs> <laughs> which is always good. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, so it didn't do well. So we were, they were not giving us more movies to direct or write. Or sort of like, you know, it was the death knell for our deal there. And then I went through a period of, um, you know, of, of almost making about four other movies, but not actually making them, which, you know, took up a couple of years. And it's actually interesting that that's the most important part of this whole story, which is that like, you know, everyone gets their break if they stick with it long enough. But there's an expectation that your career trajectory will be, you know, this. Oh, wait, I mean, went backwards, this. And it's not. Everyone's career trajectory is this. You know, so I went like this. So it was a Cinderella story, and then Midnight came. And then, so then I, like, you know, was just um, ungainfully employed. I was working, you know, 15 hours a day trying to get movies made, uh, earning nothing. And at the end of the day, oh, my executive was fired or we're not actually going to make this or we're going to push this down the road. And, you know, so I had that part of my career for a little while. And, um, 
And then I realized, okay, so no one's uh, no one's hiring me to direct their movies, so I have to create my own movies. So I just started writing movies, and then I became a um, and then I became a writer. And then, like for, I had a whole writing career until I was able to get back on the directing horse in television. That's what drew me to television. Was um, it was like resurrecting my directing career. Interesting. And how did that? Um, how did that opportunity present itself or, or did you? Well, I started writing, you know, I wrote, I wrote a movie, I wrote a couple of movies that I was going to direct until the very last minute and then they got made. Um, but I didn't get to direct them, which was, uh, you know, and then like six, that's six months of therapy right there. <laughs> and, um, so I was doing very well as, a. it was either optioning spec features or I was getting, I was getting work as a script doctor, you know, we're going to production. We hate our script. What can you do to help us? And I'm like, well, if you hate it, how did you get, how'd you, you get this far? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, anyway, so I became friends with a, a, a man named Rick Rosenthal who directed a movie that I uh, did a, re a huge rewrite on called Ruskies. Um, and uh Years after that, a couple of years after that, he called me up and he said, they just directed a pilot for a TV series and I want, we're screening it to come and look at it. And then if you like it, you know, pitch ideas for episodes. And I was like, I'm a feature guy, you know, but I'll come. <laughs> you know? And then I, so then I watched this beautiful piece of film that had me in tears at the end. And I thought, this is exactly the kind of stuff I want to do. It's a, a series about a family with a Down syndrome teenager. And, uh, and then I read some of the scripts they had written for future episodes. And I thought, oh my God, these other writers, they know more about writing than I do. Like these are really, like, these are really good. I could learn a lot from this. So yeah, I'm in, what do I have to do? So I went and pitched some stuff and they rejected all of my ideas. But literally um, as I was like leaving the room, you know, the showrunner is saying, okay, well, you know, I guess that was my TV career. They said, oh, we have an idea. We'll pitch to you. <laughs> and there was this episode they wanted to make about a bunch of middle-aged guys having an annual football game. And I said, oh, yeah, I can do that. So I did a spec script for them, and they liked it. And then I was uh, – became. they invited me to be a staff writer. Wow. And, uh, that was and Life I Goes just, On. I, I was a staff writer for a year. Uh, and for, you know, every day of that year, I told them, you know, I'm a director. <laughs> and so these these two wonderful gentlemen, Rick Rosenthal and Michael Braverman, who were running the show, went to bat for me because it's been a long time now since I directed. They went to bat for me at Warner Brothers to get me a directing episode, and then I was like back on the saddle. <laughs> and then I was in love with television. Oh, that was such a great show too! I remember watching that when I was a kid. Um, I love Life Goes On. Oh, thank you. It was, it was so a good. great experience. <laughs> and so, obviously, you know, as they say, the toughest, the toughest gig in television as a director to get is your first one. And uh, so there you were, kind of off to the races. Or was is there another midnight that comes before the next? No, no, spike? no. I, I, I never had a midnight like the first one. <laughs> <laughs> um, although it wasn't, you know, it's it's you know there it, it was smooth sailing. In, in fits and starts like any career and dry periods and rich periods and you know um, it's actually the 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 first one's hard to get and the second one's hard to get yeah because the second one you know unless you're like wildly successful in the first one but then the second one's hard to achieve because everyone's watching you thinking like oh, okay so is this you know is this a one hit wonder or is this like kid got the goods? You know? <laughs> so you really prove yourself with your second one. Interesting. So now it's sounding even more difficult for the journey I have in front of me. So thank you for that. Now I know, and not only do I have to figure out how to get the first one, I got to figure out how to get the second one. <laughs> Still have Don Duckwall's phone number. <laughs> <laughs> nice. I'll give, him a, I'll give him a shout. <laughs> um, great. So and now when you hit your stride, um, what would you say was your favorite show to be a part of for whatever reason? Well, there's, there's, 
there's three, three that stand out. Uh, the first was Life Goes On. Not only because it was my first one and it was exciting to learn television and I got my, you know, directing chops back. Um, but it was, um, it was, you know, here we are marching, you know, I, I was, I, I moved up in the writing department in the second two years of the four year run, I ran the writing room. Wow. And, um, uh, cause Michael Braverman and Rick Rosenthal had, they had other pilots and they weren't there all the time. So they, I was like, became like their lieutenant, but Braverman's, um, marching orders for the show were that every episode had to be in some way about unconditional love. So that's a great assignment. That's a great <laughs> reason to get up in the morning, and go to work. Sure. You know, that's your job <laughs> to talk to. And we had like an audience of like 12 million people. You know, and uh, so to talk to 12 million people about unconditional love once a week <laughs> was really sweet. And we, you know, we were deeply involved with the Down syndrome community. And in the second two years, we did a, uh, we had the first HIV positive character. And we did a whole two year story arc about AIDS back in the day when people like were terrified and dropping like flies and no one knew how it was transmitted. And, Right. You know, the last great health crisis. Um, so, and we actually broke, like people, uh, actors who were HIV positive were not getting hired because no one like, whoa, what if he goes to crap service? We might get it. And, and we broke that barrier. Nice. We started hiring only HIV positive actors <laughs> just to get everyone back to work. Right. So that show is, is probably my favorite because the, boundary between making the show and the real world was very thin. We we're always talking to real people. We were down at county hospital, talking to AIDS patients, bringing them on the show, you know? And so the, the fact that we were out in the world so much, not making our little show and sending it off uh, was heady and, you know, magnificent. Never, you know, I've never had experience like that since. So um, that's one. Second one was uh, Hell on Wheels. Interesting. Because, and that's just much more selfish because if someone told me I could only make Westerns the rest of my life, it'd be the best news I ever heard. <laughs> so, you know, so I got to make Westerns and I got great scripts and an enormous amount of creative freedom and wonderful actors. And it was a pure, you know, we were making Hell on Wheels out in the middle of nowhere with really simple equipment. You know, our crane was basically just a giant stick, <laughs> a giant metal stick, the most primitive crane in the world. And we just had horses and wagons and shiny boards and, you know, <laughs> really, it was like making movies in 1920. And so it was this pure filmmaking experience with really interesting things to talk about. And the third was uh, uh, Battlestar which also was, you know, a family. Um, I made lifelong friends, great scripts, a lot of creative freedom, really talking about something. So that's the triumvirate for me. That was certainly one of my favorite shows, uh, not just as a sci-fi fan. I, th I think whenever I try to tell people about that show, I say, listen, it's not a show about, it's not a science fiction show. It's a show about survival. It's a show about people and humanity. And, and every time I recommend it to somebody who's not a sci-fi fan, they become a fan of that show because of how well written it is. I mean, Ron Moore and his team just did an amazing job. And obviously the yeah. directing of the episodes and everything just so good. Yeah. He, Ron Moore's a genius. And uh, he was also, you know, for me, um, you know, he hired people who we thought knew their stuff and let them do it. And that was down the road. That was everybody. He didn't micromanage at all. And I've been on many shows where, you know, it's like, oh, here's how we do it. You do it the way we do it. And But Ron Moore was like, make your movie. Let me know when you're done. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> yeah. And I, I don't know that a lot of people outside of the industry understand this sort of difference between filmmaking and uh, directing for television. But like, for instance, if I'm going to go make a film, I have a DP and several department heads that I love to work with that I can bring on and we make the movie together. But when it's TV, you're coming in 
to their house, like completely, right? It's yeah. almost like the DP is 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 there um, providing the through line, and then you're coming in as a guest. And uh, it's very different because you never know what you're going to get from show to show or episode to episode, right? I mean, what is there a challenging dynamic, do you think, um, when it comes to working with people that you don't necessarily know that well that you have to work so closely with? It's, it's one of my favorite parts of the job because you just like you just, you know, you're, you're invited to a party. And you don't know anybody. Well, sometimes you know people. After a while, you start to recognize people, you know. <laughs> but um, you have to be a very quick study when you step into a show because, like, okay, so who's actually making the decisions? You know, where, where are the landmines? What's the power structure? Who's afraid of who? <laughs> who's working for who? You know, how do I protect myself? How do I serve the show? You know, so there's, there's this, like, you're like an undercover spy. <laughs> and I find that thrilling and really challenging because, you know, half the time I'm wrong. <laughs> and, you know, and then it's like, then there's all these actors you've never worked with. And it's like, okay, well, every actor needs something different. Some actors love a lot of talk about the character and going deep. And some actors need to be left alone so they can think. Some actors need like just one little secret. So, you know, and so I have to figure that out. I can't figure that out by the end. I have to figure that out on the first day <laughs> to be effective, you know? And so um, um, that's, you know, that's extremely challenging. And, you know, I, and I love that part of it. Yeah. So, it's, yeah. So, yeah. It's but definitely... actually, you, know, you do that in a feature too, because, you know, you don't always, you can't always staff it with everyone, you know. Sure. People aren't, people aren't available. The producer wants this person. You know, so often you're linking arms, you know, with strangers and um, like, okay, let's go, <laughs> you know, <let's, laughs> we'll discover each other as we go. It's, the, the business is all about getting married without dating. <laughs> <laughs> what a good way to put it. <laughs> and terrifying at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Well, we talked a little bit about, and by the way, uh, for anybody listening, the reason why um, I've been lucky enough to have Michael on this episode uh, is he so graciously allowed uh, me to be mentored by him uh, a little bit. And um, if we ever get back to production, eventually, yeah. hopefully I will <laughs> come out to one of your sets. Um, but more than just being around the set, we talked a lot about pre-production and how important it is to have all of those ducks in a row before day one of shooting. And I just want to talk a little bit about your process in pre-production. And when you come on to a show, um, how do you get oriented? How do you figure out all of those landmines and, and, and how you actually want to shoot the show, which is a whole separate issue. <laughs> well, it's, you know, my, um, if I, if I had a, if I could have one t-shirt made for, <laughs> to wear on, uh, on a project, it would be fix it in prep. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, I like that shirt. Um, prep, prep is very like you cannot over prep. It's not possible to over prep. Um, you know, so I'll walk on. Let's, let's say I'm doing one episode of the show, which is which happens about half the time now. Most productions, well, half the productions do um, block shooting. So you're actually putting two episodes and shooting two episodes block, which is you at least have a little time to breathe and prep. But if I'm doing one episode, I've got seven days to get ready to step on the stage. Um, the first day, you know, if the production's doing its job and getting scripts to people on time, day one of prep is uh, there's a concept meeting, which is like a, it's almost like a rehearsal for the production meeting. So all the departments gather and they go, okay, so what are the challenges? Of, let's, let's do a page through of this episode script and what are the challenges? What are we going to have to face? What what things have already been decided by previous episodes? What do we have to build that's new? Who's doing what? And you know, so uh, that is the way that prep is kicked off. But as a director, who's you know got the sort of creative responsibility of the, of the filmmaking, um, you know, I have to have a concept to present. 
I can't just be discovering it at the table with everybody. <laughs> so if I've got the script, you know, if I've got the script beforehand, which is usually the case, I'll have read it five times before day one and made all my notes and thought about like, oh, what parts do I want to expand? You know, what's really important? Like, oh, this would be great in the rain. You know, all the stuff that I can, you know, float out there early on so that people have enough time to respond. You know, it's like, I, I try really hard to give people enough time, like the people, like the showrunners to go like, I hate that idea. Or the people that actually have to make rain that day to figure out how to do it and whether the equipment's available and let wardrobe figure out what they're going to do if that's the case. And, you know, um, things like that, the earlier people know about it, the more intelligent they can be in their response. So I try to do an enormous amount of prep, uh, even before prep starts. And that's just sitting with the script and trying to figure out like what every scene's about and what it should feel like and what it might look like. And, and I'm also I'm also making script notes to the writer and the showrunner because it's because for me the most important thing to the most important tool on the first day of shooting it's not the crane or the camera or the rain or anything like that it's a script that's really good so um, I've been trying to help everyone get the script into the best place it can possibly be which is a very delicate operation because when I walk in, they've already been through network notes and production notes and, you know, you know, so they're really like, you have to be very gentle to crack things open again <laughs> and go like, well, wait a minute, if he says this in scene four, why is he doing that? And, you know, like that kind of stuff. And, and you know, TV's done very quickly and things are not always locked down the best way. So if I can get that in you know, my script notes in early and have like some kind of idea about what I want to do in the concept meeting, then things kind of flow from that. Interesting. And then uh, at that point, obviously you're dealing with all those uh, department heads and discovering all of the landmines and the other things that you were yeah. thinking about. Well, then it's, you know, then it's location scouting and wardrobe meetings and prop meetings and try, you know, and there's, there's two kinds of TV shows. One, with one DP. So during your prep, the DP is not available, he's shooting and you have to grab him at lunch, you know, or talk, sweet talk him into spending some time on the weekend with you. <laughs> and, um, or the other kind of show has alternating DPs in which, which I prefer because then your DP is with you during prep and is seeing all the locations and, you know, you're not backing him into a corner on anything and you have seven days to throw ideas around and what about this lens and should we use what if we shot this thing on super eight and you know that kind of stuff to to just throw ideas out um you know usually usually scripts are too ambitious for the budget and so there's always in tv prep uh, a winnowing down to the bare essentials wow do we really need that crowd scene you know um, but knowing that, what I do is I build it bigger in the first half of prep. Because I know there's other people whose job it is to make it smaller. <laughs> so I'm not going to help them. Smart. <laughs> so I just, I just fill it with ideas. I build it up as much as I possibly can. And, we'll come, and I know that there's going to be a, you know, a, a come to Jesus meeting <laughs> where we're going to have to pick and choose what, what things are actually going to be done. But if I've thrown a lot of new ideas into the mix then the best ideas will survive, you know, sure. whether they were there before me or they came up during prep or I came up and it doesn't matter where they came from, but I just try to bring as much new stuff to it and encourage other people to bring as much new stuff to it so that when we get to that point where we got to cut, that we're really cutting the stuff that's not as strong. Sure. Uh, so then once you're through that prep process and now you're, uh, that, that includes casting and, and all of that. And, and now you're into production and uh, tell me a little bit about that experience for you. Well, you know, my, my sort of like overarching theory is that, you know, prep is using a, using a musical metaphor. Prep is learning the melody. Shooting is playing jazz. 
You know, you have to, if you, if you, if you spend prep shot listing and storyboarding and working it and, and lock it and setting it in stone, which I do, um, once the, once you step foot on the stage, you have to be willing to throw it all out, which I do. <laughs> um, because in prep, you don't really like when you step on the stage, you know, you've got the, you've got the actors in costume, you're on the set, you know what the weather is, you know what mood everyone's in. Like until you have all the information of what's happening in that moment, you can't really know what the scene is. But if you haven't done your prep, then you're lost. If you've sure. done your prep, you've gone through it all so many times and you've gone through it and you know every prop and you know everything about the scene. Um, the fact that the process of prepping rigidly allows you to understand what the spine of the scene is and you know the, all the things that must be in the scene to make it work and, and set up things coming down the road and paying off things that came before. And then you also know all the things that can go and it won't hurt it. And so with, so that gives you confidence on the set. The fact that you've prepped so rigorously and you just know it so well. And of course you can never know it well enough to, you know, you know, there's always, you can always use another week of prep. <laughs> um, but at that point, then I can go like, okay, putting my script aside, let's read it. Let me see what's going on here. And I'm happiest when my plan doesn't work. And I have to invent in the moment because I'm inventing in the moment from a, position of being very, very well informed. Sure. Like I know this episode backward and forward, so I can dance in there. And, um, you know, unless you're throwing some huge thing, unless you're saying like, oh, we need a steady cam and you've never mentioned it. <laughs> that, I don't do that kind of shit because that just makes everyone freak <laughs> out and you can't get it anyway. Um, but, but I have done the opposite where it's like, I was saying, you know what, that rain thing, yeah. <laughs> cancel the towers <laughs> but, but it's really about I've been, but that's i'm being sort of funny there but you know it's about the moment it's like what's happening in the scene and how do i you know now that i have all this new information today right now how do i incorporate that and bring it to the moment and make it alive interesting very cool um so what would you say is one of the more challenging things for you on set is it guiding the shots or is it more working with the actors or what do you find to be the most challenging? The clock. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. It's time, you know, there's it, actually, I'm, I'm kind of of two minds about it. Cause part of me is, is exhilarated by the, um, the like, let's go. Okay. Let's do another scene. Okay. Come on. Let's go more stuff. Let's go you know, and be able to do a lot of work. But I also know that, you know, that I'm always like every day at some point I'm be pushed into the moment, which I hate, which is like, uh, it's not great, but I got to move on. You know, I didn't get that thing I really wanted. And we're like 90%, but like, ah, shit, I can't destroy the other scene. I got to move. So that's, you know, that's the yin and the yang of it. <laughs> Oh yeah, and you've got to make your days right because if you don't, you're not getting yeah. hired again. <laughs> yeah, so you can get that difficult second chance. <laughs> That's right. Okay, so now uh, walk me through post for you. So what's the commitment look like? Um, are you in the editing room or are you waiting for cuts? Well, in, in episodic, the guild you know guarantees you four days on an episode. So the the way you're protected is that you're the first audience of the editor's assembly. You know, the producer, the showrunner, they can't see it until you're done. They can't, they can't, what's called cutting behind. Like they can't let you have your cut. In the meantime, they're talking to the editor at night, doing their own, just getting their own cut ready. You can't do that. And, you know, almost all showrunners are very respectful of the process because they want to see your ideas. Like what, did, like what's Nankin going to bring, you know? Um, and they also know that, you know, they push you a button, they can go back to the editor's assembly. Sure. You know, so they're, you know, they're, they're good. And, you know, maybe I'll come up with something they like. So, I, you know, I go in for four days and, you know, I'm, I'm ruthless. 
you know, I, I shoot long. My first assemblies are usually too long because I'm always looking in a scene on the set. I'm always looking for the unwritten moment. You know, it's like there's two lines of dialogue and, you know, maybe that second one doesn't follow immediately. Maybe there's a moment here. The actors look at each other and there's a silent, there's actually a silent conversation going on where they need to break away from each other and then come back or, you know, that kind of stuff that cracks open the scene. And I'll always, you know, always shoot that stuff. And I'm always trying to shoot extra stuff when I can, you know, stuff implied by the script but not actually written. And if I have an extra 10 minutes, like, oh, let's get this shot where he's just walking down the street, you know, where he's just thinking about things or, you know, I'm always, I'm always trying to add as much as I can to it give you options so, so i shoot i shoot fat but i edit like a 12 year old with add <laughs> <laughs> it's like got it cut next what got it you know because the audience is smart and they absorb material fast and so i go into it you have to, when you go into the editing room you have to hate the director <laughs> And you have to hate all his like fancy shots and you have to like <laughs> hate the fact that he took two hours to get this one shot. It doesn't matter anymore. No one cares. And so I have to split myself in two and forget everything that was, that I loved on the set or that was precious or that we broke our asses to get. None of that matters. Now it's like, let's, let's get to the, let's, let's tell the story, you know, in the most, you know, beautiful way you can. What's consistent about prep shooting and post is that is that my job is to be the audience. What does the audience need? I mean, that's you know the best description I ever heard of the director's job is is the audience's representative on the set because the audience can't be there to say what they need, right? Sure. So the director, has to, the Spielberg, there's a great Spielberg quote where he says, "I'm not a great director, I'm a great audience." <laughs> and it's true it's like you have to like you know and and here, this is interesting the 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 thing that exhausts me by the end of the day of shooting is that so like okay we're doing a scene right we do a take the actor's not there's a the actor could you know there's some other way the actor could go than what we just shot so i've thought about it for a second I will go to the actor, I whisper in the actor's ear, give the actor like some, what I think is some brilliant piece of directing. The actor goes, oh my God, thank you, that's great. And we do a take, we do, okay, okay, let's roll it again. Let's do another take. I go back and sit down and I watch. And at that point, that's where my work starts because my ego at that point wants to be right. Hmm. You know, I want to, I want the next take to prove what a great director I am. <laughs> I want the actor to do a really great job. I want it to look beautiful. And I want to like, uh, and at the end of that take, I want to say like, see, I know my, what I'm doing. Like all of that, all of those expectations and feelings are not audience feelings. They're <laughs> ego feelings. And so if I give, if I give into them at all, I won't be an audience. I won't be watching it. I won't be able to judge whether it's a good take or not. You know, because it'll be like, if he, oh, if he does my note successfully, then it's a good take. Well, that doesn't matter. <laughs> so the process of pushing my ego out of, the, out of it, forgetting the note I gave, forgetting the other take, and just being a blank slate and, and just being an audience who's seeing it for the first time, that's an enormous amount of energy. You do that on every take. That's incredible. It's great advice, too, especially in a business where – Ego is such a big thing, you know, to be wary oh, of it. It's your worst enemy. Yeah, absolutely. Well, listen, I want to be really respectful of your time. I really appreciate you coming on and doing this. I just have one final question. Um, yeah, I've got, I've got in three hours, I have to make a sandwich. So that's very important. <laughs> <It's> my day. <laughs> You'd be surprised how many interviews I've lined up this week. It's pretty crazy. Yeah. <laughs> um, the question is really, you know, you've been um, already so helpful uh, to me as far as from an educational standpoint um, and to our listeners as well. And I know that you also help um, actors with an audition class and you're constantly, I think, trying to help people achieve their dreams. And that's really uh, amazing of you. And if, if there's just one thing that you 
want to say to people who are trying to get into the film industry or the television industry? Uh, I would love to hear what that might be. Make sure you love it. It's really hard. You know, it's a, it's, it's a ridiculous way to live your life. <laughs> <laughs> and it's very hard on your family. And it's very hard on your health. You know, and um, it's psychologically, you know, it's a psychological sledgehammer. So, you know, if you, there are people who are in it because once upon a time they loved it. And there are people who are in it because they actually love it. And there are people who are in it because they had the wrong idea about what it meant. And only the people who actually love it um, have a good life. <laughs> you know, it's just, you know, it's like, you know, when I teach, I've, I've, when I can, I teach young directors. And so um, on the, within the first 10 minutes of class one, we talk about the difference between wanting to be a director and wanting to direct. Because if you want to be a director, you're insane. <laughs> <laughs> and you have some... Uh, unrealistic idea of what that is and it, and it has to do with being in command and walking the red carpet and hanging out with attractive people and you know having people bring you a nice tea when you're thirsty and you know being the boss of everybody and none of those things are true except the iced tea and um so if you want to be a director you're you're in for a world of hurt um if you want to tell stories on film so badly that you will take on the burden of being a director, <laughs> then you're in for a good time. <laughs> Very well said. Because <laughs> it doesn't matter. Like the, 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 the pain of it doesn't matter because you're getting to do this like fantastic thing, you know, that's only existed for a hundred years. <laughs> and, you know, and that very few people get to do. And so if you just like, if that process of being, you know, freezing cold at two in the morning, and you're, and you're, you know, and you've got a fever and people are yelling at you and the lights are breaking and you've got to get the scene. And if that's the thing that makes you happy, <laughs> then, that's, then you're in the right business. <laughs> nice. <laughs> I'll tell you, I'll tell you, here's, I, I, you know, one of the great um, gifts of doing this is that I get to meet all kinds of like really high caliber people. And so, uh, I just want to tell everyone a story about uh, Kevin Murphy, who's a showrunner I worked with on Defiance. And I just started and I had directed a couple of episodes and I was, which was shot in Toronto. And I was back in LA with him editing. And, uh, um, but I was the directing producer on the show. So after my edit, I had to get back and sort of be there for the rest of the season. So, I'm in his office and the phone rings and there's some kind of disaster on the set and they need us to put out some fires. I can't even remember what it was, but his reaction was, um, okay, great, good. Let's go to work. And every other showrunner I'd ever met would have in that moment gone, ah, fuck, what is it? Now what? <laughs> what do I have to do now? And it suddenly dawned on me. It's like, yeah, like the, like it's always something's wrong on the set. It's always some fire to put out. If you don't love that, if you don't love bringing like everything you've learned and who you are and, you know, this enthusiasm to that, like that's all you do, really. <laughs> <laughs> True. <laughs> that's awesome. Well, listen, it, it's been great uh, having you on here. Um, I really appreciate you uh, giving up all this time that you oh, could be working. Truly, my pleasure. Um and, uh, and hopefully we'll get back to some normalcy here in a few months and yeah. uh, you'll be back on the set shouldering that burden once again. Okay. Um, thank you. Thanks. Uh, thank you again. And um, uh, yeah, we will talk soon. Okay. Thank you for what you're doing here, AJ. <laughs> oh, no worries. I think it's fun. <laughs> it's great to hear these stories, by the way. I mean, it's, you know, it's yeah. one thing to read a book about, you know, how things are done and, you know, I have some experience as, as a director in my own world, but, you know, it's always different um, to hear how it works in the television side or, you know, various positions um, of people, visual effects supervisors and the like, uh, how they view their process and hearing it firsthand through you 
really has been eye-opening for me uh, and hopefully for everybody listening. Good. Hope so. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. That's another episode of The Call Sheet in the Books. I'm your host, AJ Wedding. You can follow me on Instagram at that director AJ, or join our Facebook page, The Call Sheet, for updates on the show. See you next time.